Hi, uh, I'm Rebecca Roberts. Um, I'm from the charity Inquest. Um, Inquest is an independent charity. We've been around since 1981 and we were formed following families' campaigns for truth, justice and accountability following deaths in state care. Um, and we, uh, we work alongside families. We provide advice and support to them following uh, a death um, in state custody, and that includes deaths in prisons, police custody, mental health settings, immigration detention. Um, and a key thing running across our work um, going back almost 40 years is around um, the uh, violence of criminal justice and um, things that are often hidden behind closed doors of institutions. And it's through our work with families and campaigns coming out of deaths in custody that we can shine a light on the conditions inside criminal justice. Um, and we work for sort of short-term reforms to try to make those institutions safer, but actually we're driven by a long-term vision of social justice and, and, and ending deaths that are caused by unsafe systems of, of care and detention. My name's Patrick Williams. I work as a senior lecturer in criminology at Manchester Met University. But I'm, but, but, I, <laughs> but I'm also involved in a number of research and campaigns in collaboration with um, activist organisations. Um, I just want to use a minute just to reflect on the type of work I've been involved with over the last 20 years. I guess what's driven me is this notion of disproportionality and discrimination within the criminal justice system. So what we still know today is that black, mixed race, Asian, minority ethnic people are nine times more likely still to be stopped and searched. In some parts of the country, that goes up to 20 times more likely to be stopped and searched. What we know is that over half of young people now in young offender institutions are from a black, Asian or minority ethnic background. What we also increasingly know is that the details and the personal details of black and brown people are increasingly being held on gangs databases and these same groups have been subjected to collective punishments through the form of joint enterprise. What I also want to remark on is that the prison population across England and Wales, or the Muslim prison population, has doubled over the last 14 years. I guess for me, it's about being clear that crime rates and offending behaviour cannot explain disparity within the criminal justice system. So what we need to begin to think about is what is driving this disparity and this discrimination. And as part of me wants to maybe have a conversation about black and brown people still being seen as suspects. And as a result of that, that is what's driving the criminal justice system. I also want to finally just wrap up on the reality that we are in a point of crisis. So whilst we're in a point of crisis, what, what we tend to do in crisis is to advocate for more police or for more law and order. What I want to engage in the conversation about is the problems of increasing the numbers of police officers across England and Wales, because that will have a direct impact upon the harms experienced by black and brown communities. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Tanzil Chowdhury. I'm a lecturer in public law and human rights at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, I was a co-founder of the Northern Police Monitoring Project, which is an independent organization founded in Greater Manchester that supports uh, individuals, families, and communities um, that have faced police racism, harassment, and brutality. Um, although I will be speaking to some of the stuff that I did with the Northern Police Monitoring Project, um, I am going to be speaking in an individual capacity, given some of the uh, constraints that the Northern Police Monitoring Project has as an organization and, and, and sharing platforms with political parties, which uh, I have myself to blame, given that I wrote the constitution for the organization. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as an organisation, uh, the Northern Police Monitoring Project uh, works uh, work focuses on the police, but also policing. So by the latter, we mean the ways in which primarily working class black and Asian communities uh, are disciplined um, and the way in which that role has been uh, delegated to public sector servants. Um, and we also work with uh, academics, activists um, and advocates, uh, lawyers to uh, address those issues on an individual, but also on a systemic basis as well. Hey all, uh, my name is Divya Sundaram. I was the deputy campaign manager for Tiffany Caban's race for district attorney over in Queens, New York. Um, and that was a race that really helped reimagine what criminal justice could look like in the United States. And it was building off of a trend we had seen across the country where 
public defenders were running for this office with a really decarceral mindset and really thinking about what would it look like if someone held that role that is typically associated with law and order and punishing people and locking people away? What if someone held that role and was really focused not on incarceration, but on creating community stability? Um, and so unfortunately, Tiffany lost that race, but the movement continues. Um, and in addition to working on that campaign, I am the policy coordinator for Community Voices Heard, which is a nonprofit in New York that organizes with low income communities and communities of color. Um, and I think the thread throughout the work that I've done over the past few years is really just thinking about how do we put directly impacted communities in the driver's seat of creating policies that impact them. Um, so, you know, black and brown communities, uh, low income communities, um, LGBTQIA communities, really helping to build power uh, for the larger movement. Hi everyone, my name is Luke Hayes uh, from the Bronx, New York, and I've been involved in democratic campaigns and issue organizing in the states uh, for over 10 years, uh, notably on the Barack Obama campaigns in 2008 and 2012 and uh, also worked on some education and immigration uh, advocacy uh, as well. Uh, Divya I interviewed with, uh, along with Tiffany Caban, and joined the campaign um, for the final push uh, to really kind of see a, uh, a campaign focused on decarceral uh, approach to uh, you know, prosecution uh, take off in a way that I don't think we, we expected, um, but uh, really I think showed a lot of potential uh, for the movement as far as uh, electoral organizing and what you can run on and how you can interact with voters and really get their buy-in on a new vision for criminal justice. Thank you so much, our amazing panel. Um, so the first kind of question that I'd like to get into is sort of, you know, this is an introductory panel and how do we understand this as a kind of wider framework? So the word decarceral has been used a couple of times. Um, what does this really mean and how do you see your work connecting with the other work of, of, of members of the panel? You can go in any order if you want to go. You can go back to front. I'll kick things off. Um, you know, uh, Tiffany Caban uh, is a member. Uh, you know, member of Democratic Socialists of America, um, and I think one thing that she did very effectively was tie in, you know, criminal justice reform and the criminalization of poverty to kind of you know larger issues of inequality. Um, and, you know, in, in New York City, Rikers Island is where we have our, our jail for New York City. And it's also the largest mental health institution in New York City. Um, and I think that's pretty significant when <laughs> uh, a jail serves as the kind of largest provider of mental health services. Um, and I think Tiffany was very effective at uh, kind of drawing these connections between, you know, economic disparities, um, institutional racism and kind of what that does and the you know, the iterative effect it has on, on law and order and, you know, more police, more, more jails and, and more sort of enforcement. Yeah, so I guess the, the really interesting thing is obviously all the panelists so far, we're, we're all coming from it saying that there are particular groups in society who are more likely to experience this uh, carceral state. So the punishment of the state through policing, um, disproportionate surveillance, um, arrest, uh, detention, um, being imprisoned or just experiencing the, the fear of um, the state in your life. The, the way that the majority of people in the media or in the mainstream sort of uh, political space talk is as though prisons, policing, uh, law and order is something that is a public good. The prisons and police are the things in society that keep us safe. And the thing about this panel is that showing that actually in reality for people who are marginalized, whether they be poor, whether they be LGBTQ, whether they be a migrant, whether they be a sex worker, um, whether they be black or brown um, or indigenous communities, these people are not looking to the state as a form of safety or as a form of justice. Um, they actually are uh, experiencing the state in an incredibly violent way. And this is for us in the Decrim Now campaign, something that is really at the heart of the organizing we do. 
um, sex workers, generally speaking, are people that are pushed towards the margins of society um, by the law itself, criminalizing our work um, and criminalizing the associated activities around our work. So being able to work together for safety is a criminal offense in this country. Um, or in Northern Ireland, it's actually a crime for someone to pay for sex, which means that uh, sex workers' clients are surveilled or potentially um, uh arrested by the police, which actually reduces our safety in a many, many myriad of ways, and yet is treated as though that's a, a way in which the, the state is trying to help us. Um, I think the really interesting thing is that a lot of the time in sex worker rights, um, we haven't necessarily made the links all the time about, um, in, in as in explicit ways we're trying to do with this campaign, about the links between prison abolition, against austerity, against all the forms um, of violence that the state can inflict on marginalized people. And so it's really great to be on the panel and kind of being able to pull out these kind of themes because all of these struggles are really connected to one another and it's about understanding that there are other forms of safety, justice and um, community building that can keep us safe and that those actually are away from the traditional state apparatus and actually the traditional straight ap state apparatus um, is often the key form of violence that marginalized people can experience in their lives rather than the boogeyman out there that uh, Boris Johnson talks about saving us from when he says he's going to get 20,000 more police on the streets. Yeah, one of the things that I'd like um, my, my kind of colleagues on the panel to also maybe speak to is the ways in which um, policing has kind of rearticulated itself. So not uh, just focusing on the, the place of an institution and the things that they, uh, they have done and they continue to do, but the way in which uh, policing uh, as a process has been subcontracted to the public sector. So a good, good example of this is this, like uh, stuff like the counter-terrorism strategy and the prevent program and the way in which um, we have you know, public sector servants like doctors, teachers, nurses, exercising the function of the police and the ways in which that changes our understanding of policing and the ways in which that may have to, uh, we may have to kind of reconfigure our resistance and, and response to that. Because, uh, you know, policing is just something that happens through the police force, but it's now being kind of uh, delegated to these kinds of institutions that we face uh, day to day. Yeah, I guess um, I can pick up on that. So I suppose Liberty's concerns are we are very concerned about the impact of policing and counter-terror and immigration controls on marginalized groups. But we're also concerned about what that says about state power, um, because those are powers that are then not necessarily going to be confined to those marginalized groups. Um, very often, when you look at the face of a law or you look at the face of a power, it's a power that, in theory, can be used against anybody. And you might have a government that puts it on the statute books, you know, with a particular uh, ideological lens or that agrees to be constrained in some way, but that doesn't prevent a future government from targeting different people depending on whoever the demon is, you know, in 10, 20, 30 years time. And I think that's something that's really important to guard against. But just to pick up on what Tanzel was saying about policing being contracted out, um, it's the same in immigration enforcement. So I've done a lot of work, Liberty has done a lot of work opposing the hostile environment. Um, and in very broad terms, it's essentially a set of policies that aim to make life so unbearable for people who are undocumented that they will leave the UK voluntarily. Um, ostensibly, undocumented migrants are the people who are the target. But actually, what you end up with is a climate of suspicion around anybody who seems visibly foreign, whatever that is defined as, you know, in a public servant's eyes. And of course, a society in which we're all conditioned to be showing biometric ID to do really mundane things like go and rent a flat or register at the GP surgery. Um, and in our work against the hostile environment or in the implementation of the hostile environment, what we've obviously seen is teachers, doctors, landlords, etc., co-opted into the business of checking people's papers and refusing access to essential goods and services. And that's obviously a human rights issue for the people who then can't access essential goods and services. Um, but it's also an issue for all of us who don't think that actually those public servants should be able to intrude into our lives in that way. Um, and I suppose when I was thinking about 
who does Liberty's work intersect with, I thought a lot about the work of the Decrim Now campaign, because of course, if the whole point of the hostile environment is to stop you from having a regular job because illegal working is a criminal offence or driving while unlawfully in the UK, that's a criminal offence. You are criminalised as a landlord if you rent to somebody who's undocumented. So then people are going to end up in basically living with people who are willing to bend the rules and who are likely to charge extortionate rents. Um, it also means even if you're not undocumented, visa fees are so high that you're going to have lots of fees to pay at really short intervals. And if you lose your job and your immigration status is dependent on your employer or on your spouse, how are you going to earn any money? So for some people, sex work is going to be the only viable option available to them because of how immigration controls in our society function. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of pick up on the concept of power and state power um, and also like this trend that I think a lot of the fellow panelists have identified that we are in a system, whether you're, you're in the UK or the United States or anywhere else, we're in systems where the people who hold power have designed systems that are oppressing us and are holding us down and creating these different marginalized communities. Um, and it really sucks, right? Like you make organizing around these issues and actually trying to build campaigns to address all of these terrible material conditions that people are suffering with, you make it hard to build those campaigns and to like keep going with the work. Um, so just going back to this concept of power, I think what we are all trying to do here in different ways is actually build power for these different marginalized communities. Um, and by building power, um, what we're really trying to advance towards is deeper structural change. And by structural change, that means like a clear, distinct shift in power from the state, from the people who are benefiting from these systems towards the people that we are organizing with. Um, and I, I guess I just want to like inject this into the conversation, like what sort of structural changes do you all want to see in the work that you're doing? Um, and just thinking about how our work sort of intersects with the other campaigns and organizations represented here, I suppose something that runs through it is kind of who and what is criminal. You know, we all have these common understandings about what crime is. It's theft, it's murder, it's violence. But then when you look beneath the, beneath the surface and you look at what, what the criminal justice system does and who it focuses on, it doesn't tackle most harm and most violence in society. Um, but through our kind of media, through our culture, we have this kind of dependency on the police as our saviors. The prisons are the place where we put bad people and it keeps the rest of us safe. But when you look inside those institutions, when you work with people affected by the criminal justice system, when you look at the stats and the data and the evidence, we know that this criminal justice system is not protecting us from some of the most serious harms that we face. And I think there is a, you know, there is a recognition in terms of the harms of austerity, um, but that is closely aligned with the harms of the criminal justice system. Um, and the development of prisons policing evolved alongside the evolution of capitalism. Um, and if we think about who's being protected now, people do bad things, people harm each other. Um, and I wouldn't question whether we need to intervene and whether something needs to be done. But the question is whether criminal justice is the best route to do that. Um, and we know through our work uh, following deaths in custody, I mean, when you look inside the prison system, every four days in prison, someone takes their own life. Um, and when we work with families, you know, often they say, well, did we do something? Did we fail them? But then what emerges is it wasn't them that failed their loved one. It was multiple state failings um, from kind of mental health, housing, um, education. And so when we look inside kind of the criminal justice system and we ask about who is criminal, we need to sort of take a step back and look at the broader structures. Um, this work, I mean, the work that we do, although we kind of prisons, policing, immigration, detention, we also work alongside families uh, whose loved ones have died in sort of learning disability settings, in mental health settings. And also we have a project supporting bereaved families through Grenfell. Now, that, that, there are common threads running through all of those instances of kind of state power, of death by indifference. Um, where it's beyond just one individual deciding to harm somebody else. It's about how we kind of treat people in need. 
um, and respond to and deal with kind of complex social problems? Oh, not at all. Um, I think the question's probably been covered by most people on the panel. Because um, for me, there's a question around, and I'd like to draw off colleagues on the panel, in relation to the ways in which we begin to make sense of what is taking place. So traditionally, in some of the organisations I would work with, would speak about notions of racism and institutional forms of racism. When we begin to see the encroachment of tech and technology and how that's beginning to conceal the practices of police, prisons, the criminal justice system, the penal apparatus, then we're almost side beginning to side foot activist and campaign organisers organizations in terms of what is taking place here. So we're no longer to talk we're no longer allowed to talk about racism. The discourses of gangs, notions of violence, county lines, all become the discourse through which we begin to make sense of the crime problem. And as Becky's already inferred, the crime problem or what is criminal is defined by those in positions of power. So I'd be really interested in how we can begin to refine our language, our lexicon in terms of being able to challenge the harms that are presented by the criminal justice system. Would anyone like to pick up on that point in particular? <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, <I will. laughs> yeah? So the two points that were coming at the two questions that I quite liked is like, you know, how do we how do we take back that language and kind of refine it and sort of address the fact that that's um clearly missing out so much of the violence that people experience in their everyday lives and um, is actually a political weapon to beat people with marginalized groups like and this is really the case for sex workers as well um, who obviously occupy a lot of these different positionalities um, as well as their occupation um, but I find it really an interesting at sort of elucidating um, the sort of way that the language of criminal justice and sort of saving um, people from their their context, etc., is kind of weaponized while at the same time kind of criminalizing them further and weaponizing that against them. So recently um, there was a, a case in Ireland of two Romanian sex workers being prosecuted um, under the brothel keeping law. Now, obviously, people would know that uh, people who proclaim that the Nordic model or the, the model in which the criminalization of the purchase of sex is in place, as well as the criminalization of brothel keeping, the people who claim that this is in sex workers' interest would say sex workers are not criminalized under the Nordic model. They are um, offered exit services and they are offered all the support in the world. They're not criminalized. We see 85% of those who have been criminalized under this law are migrant women. Let that sink in. The, the majority of people who are being criminalized for the very offense that is being put in place in order to save them is actually putting them in jail. And this is being completely allowed because the idea that people could have to or want to engage in prostitution in order to put food on the table is so wild to the majority of mainstream politicians that they, and, and actually a lot of people in, I don't know, mainstream society, I would say, that for them, the it's almost better that they go to jail than they are in prostitution, which is obviously incredibly um, dehumanizing and removes people of their agency. And, uh, and also just who who in the right mind thinks that going to prison is better than not, really. Um, but yeah, so I feel like the, the, the language that we use to talk about safety and justice and talk about really get to, to understand what role the sort of mainstream narrative law and order and and justice plays in society needs to be interrogated massively. And I think that it means that traditional NGOs, it means traditional, not necessarily traditional, but people in the mainstream left have to grapple with prison abolition. They need to grapple with uh, the issue of law and order in a way that I actually think the left for a long time hasn't been willing to address personally. I'd say that, um, you know, it's it's pretty disappointing that we have a Labour Party that is basically pairing up with um, the Tories and saying we'll just, you know, get more cops, we'll just get more prisons um, or we'll put more funding into them, etc. I think that's, that's a real shame and I'm really glad that this panel is happening here and the stream is happening here to provide a real uh, intervention into that because if we don't reckon with that then we will just end up with more of the same. I feel like I've gone a little tangent but never mind.
Um, now that I've had more than two seconds to think about it, Patrick, I will come back to you. Um, just on the point about tech, um, so I, my background is in migrants' rights advocacy and migrant support stuff. Um, I hadn't really done anything on tech and surveillance um, before coming to Liberty, uh, apart from the Against Borders for Children campaign, which is around use of data by the Home Office for immigration enforcement, children's school records. And what I would, so my colleague left, a colleague that I love dearly, she's gone to lead another organization very well, but she left and it meant I ended up leading Liberty's work on the data protection bill, um, which I wasn't very pleased about at the time, but actually was a really interesting and formative experience. And what I would say about tech is that tech advocacy in the UK is really, really specialized. Um, it's really, really literally technical, and it speaks mainly about privacy. If it's taught, it, So A, it takes place really only on the ground of human rights and data protection rights. And if human rights are spoken about, it's pretty much always in terms of privacy, tech and privacy, that's the phrase that you'll hear. Um, and I think it's really important that progressive movements and struggles are themselves, we are ourselves digitally literate, because actually when you think about what the government is trying to do, it's very rare that a new technology will make the government try to do something completely new. A new technology will aid the government, successive governments, in doing what governments in the state in general tend to do. Um, so actually, it's people who are already in progressive struggles for civil liberties and other things who understand the logic of what the state is up to and who understand what is most likely to happen when a new technology gets into government or police hands. Um, it's not generally the specialist tech NGOs who understand that and they're less able to get out ahead. So I have friends who do a lot of really excellent work on policing and racism and they'll say to me, Gracie, you're obsessed with surveillance. I'm like, I'm not obsessed with surveillance, but surveillance is a racial justice issue. Um, so I think when you're hearing about predictive policing, when you're hearing about facial recognition, Obviously, those are civil liberties issues, you know, for everybody, but they are especially issues for the groups that are already at the sharp end of state power. And that's why we really need to be on top of that. Um, the other thing I would say in terms of language around criminalization is that in looking at stuff that the state is doing in terms of predictive policing or in terms of the prevent strategy, what you actually see is an attempt to intervene before any crime occurs. Um, so it's actually not enough to look at and think about criminalization. We have to get a handle on the kinds of pre-criminal intervention that the state tries to make. Because when you look at predictive policing, I mean, these tools are basically tools that take years of police decisions, which will be flawed in all the ways that police decisions already are. They take them, they train an algorithm with that, gives it a technological you know, veneer of legitimacy makes it really hard to find out because lots of them are sold to police by private companies. So it means you can't get into the black box. You can't find out how an algorithm made a particular decision. So it's really hard to hold something to account. And it, the police are more likely to defer to that decision because a machine made it and not another human. Um, so I think it's really important that we get an understanding of what is going on in those spaces and that we understand that we're moving towards a place in which actually people are going to have their options so limited um, that you're not even going to get to the point of maybe potentially committing the crime because the decision about you will have been made based on a risk profile, um, you know, years, months before that. Okay, I've seen some hands up. I just want to say we are going to have an ample time for questions after this next question, which I'm going to ask the panel. And after this bit of the discussion, we'll open it up. Um, but this is just a kind of forward looking and, and kind of organizing focus and positive question, which is what does a world in which you have succeeded with your campaign goals look like? And how do we, every single person in this room, get involved in making that world a reality? Um, I think uh, I think one of the things we found with the Tiffany Caban campaign um, and decriminalization actually is, a, I think, a good example of this is, I think often we're told, and this is kind of a manifestation of, you know, again, institutional sort of, you're not supposed to talk about that. Um, decriminalization, we got a lot of people telling us like, you can't you can't run on that. Like Tiffany shouldn't be saying that. Um, but I think when you get past the, what you're not supposed to do um, from this kind of peer pressure and you actually have conversations with people about 
you know, decriminalization of sex work, you find out a lot of people get the logic behind it. Um, and I think that extends, you know, that's one example, but I think that extends to a lot of sort of progressive policies and kind of uh, third rails. I don't know if that's an American idiom, but just, uh, you know, these issues and topics you're not supposed to talk about because, you know, the society is not ready for it. Society can't take it. And I think what I think what we're all experiencing is uh, in the last few years, especially, I think there's been kind of a break with that where it's like you get told over and over again, you can't talk about that. You can't talk about that. You got to talk about more police. And it's like, well, you know, more police and all this has been the, the answer for 30, 40, 50 years and the system's broken. So maybe we should be talking about that. Um, and I think it was refreshing to see Tiffany uh, campaign because she didn't have to have these very nuanced answers that tried to thread the needle. Um, you know, sometimes we'd, we'd, you know, she'd, we'd be at a panel and she'd get asked about decriminalization of sex work and she's like, sex work is work. And that was her answer. Um, and you'd see people kind of nod along in the audience being like, yeah. Um, and I think, you know, like, uh, you know, I think to, well, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't, this was not, Broad, you know, there's a limit to the, the primary in, in New York, in New York City. Um, but uh, I think it just showed that, you know, just having the conversation about these these sort of topics, um, you know, in a, in a kind of rational way, um, yeah, that's that's where I think you start. Um, because I think you're, we're told over and over again, here are topics you can't talk about because of X, Y, and Z. Um, and I think once you start to kind of break through that sort of fear, uh, you find out that Voters and citizens are very rational people. Um, they're compassionate, they're understanding, especially with criminal justice. Um, and it's kind of spiraling sort of web of who's being pulled into it. Um, and I think more and more people are seeing, like, yeah, it is a broken system. Um, and yeah, we really need to do think about new ways to approach it because last 30, 40, 50 years haven't been working. Um, and just having that, having that conversation, starting that conversation, uh, I think really just gets people to think. Uh, not everyone was bought in on the decriminalization of sex work, but we found those voters were still listening to Tiffany and willing to vote for her. So maybe they weren't with her on every issue, but I think they saw her, her theme, her, her message about what can be done and how we can rethink uh, the approach to criminal justice. And maybe they're not there on all 10 points, but at least they respect her vision um, and message about you know, what that means. And I just kind of want to add on to that. So before we could even get into the conversation of like sex work is work, we also had to have the conversation with a lot of voters about, okay, what is the district attorney? What does the district attorney do? Oh, I can vote for district attorney? Like a lot of people did not know that. Um, so there's a lot of education on just like, not only that office, but the larger criminal justice system. Um, and not just explaining like what Tiffany would be able to do in that seat, but also talking very clearly about like how we could take advantage of having a public defender, having a someone with a decarceral mindset in that seat and how we could really start to fight the system of mass incarceration from the inside. Um, and I think if Tiffany had won, which unfortunately she didn't, it would have been really, really great. But at the same time, it would not have been enough to really change the system. Like one decarceral district attorney is great, but there's like a whole other country outside of Queens County, New York, that is still perpetuating the same systems. Um, so it wouldn't have been like the big structural change, but it would have been a start. And I think even though Tiffany didn't win, what was really exciting is that we built a movement that is going to last beyond the campaign. And we just we're able to talk to so many more people about this issue, about this system, and now they're paying attention and now they're aware of it. And now they're gonna hold this woman who's probably gonna be the next district attorney who isn't necessarily for decriminalization, who like barely is like getting towards some of the progressive issues that we campaigned on. These people are gonna be able to hold her accountable. And so when I think we're asking this question about like the world as it should be or as it could be, like having a base of people who are talking about these issues who are mobilized and like angry and like actually want to see change is going to be so critical to that because like these this is just like eight people on a stage we can't do all this work on our own um it's a lot and so if we can have that big base of people who are ready to like organize around this and fight with us i think that's going to make a huge difference <clears throat> um so in, in response to uh, what does the world look like where you win your campaign goals, um, 
I kind of, so I, I think that um, imagination is obviously really important to any kind of social movement um, or, or radically oriented organisation. Um, and I think that we kind of need to um, talk about the possibilities of um, police abolition, or at the very least, uh, minimalist policing. And I think that there are kind of practical, you know, this isn't, uh, you know, radical posture. I think there are practical steps that we can take um, as communities, as families, towards that kind of stuff. Um, and one of the things that we um, had discussed uh, as an organization and in the kind of work that we were doing were through these kind of practical short-term steps that you can take towards um, reducing the role of the police and then uh, abolishing them as an institution altogether. So here is a five-step guide to abolish... No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> um, so, like, w w one of the... I mean, so, um, Becky was talking about it. There are obviously kind of long-term structural issues that we need to look at. And obviously, we need to kind of dismantle the structures of, of, of racialized capitalism. Don't want to kind of go into, you know, the, the debates of that. But obviously, it's, it's that kind of economic base which determines what constitutes a crime, what doesn't constitute a crime, who is considered criminal, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of the kinds of short-term things that I, I think we can do, one of them is, I think, as a def default position, organizations that organize around police brutality and harassment ought to have a position of non-engagement with the police. Now, this isn't criticizing those individuals and organizations that do have kind of strategic engagement with the police, and I think there is a place for that. But I think the default has to be non-engagement with the police. One of the reasons I think we need to do that is because the police are not primarily concerned, I think, with um, dialogue policing, but with intrusion and infiltration. And there are numerous reports that speak to that effect. NetPol uh, released a report on um, intelligence gathering and police intrusion. Uh, and this kind of primarily critiqued the police liaison officers. They're the ones that look really, really friendly and they'll come up to you and you ask you how your day has been. And then they'll find, they'll uh, gather loads of intelligence on you and the particular social movement. Uh, it found in this report that a lot of former FIT officers, which is the intelligence gathering organization of the wing, uh, became police liaison officers. The other thing that I think non-engagement, the, the other reason why I think non-engagement with the police is important is because the ineffectiveness of the dialogue. So some of the stuff um, that became apparent to uh, organizations that I'd worked with um, are the ways in which these kinds of institutions in forums for uh, engaging with the police were rendered really, really ineffective. So I spoke to a lot of colleagues of mine in Greater Manchester who were part of these independent advisory groups whose role were to, quote, improve communications with groups not usually uh, in dialogue with the police. And what they found with these independent advisory groups is that they weren't concerned with, they didn't empower independent advisory groups to actually dictate policing uh, agendas, but it was almost kind of merely a thought form of kind of therapy, maybe communication, obviously, which is important, but it gave the police a PR win and nothing fundamentally changed. The other thing I think as well, engagement with the police can often do is to compromise community trust through this kind of infiltration. But it also limits our radical imaginations and excludes or rather precludes the possibility of minimalist, minimalist policing and eventual uh, abolition of the police. Now, the reason why this is important is because I think in a lot of the discourse around the police is we naturalize the police as if they are a, a, a force exists in every society. When in fact, obviously, they're a contingent institution which emerged with the ascendancy of industrial capitalism and with the way in which policing um, of colonized bodies happened uh, during the British Empire. Um, now, in terms of obviously the long term solutions, um, you know, a, a good place to start, which I don't think articulated anything new, but synthesized a lot of things that, um, you know, a lot of the black power movement was saying in the United States, is a book by uh, Alex, uh, Alex Vitale on the end of policing which looks at these kind of structural issues. But in terms of the short term things that I think we can do towards minimalist policing with radical accountability and eventual police abolition is the kinds of things that I think we've already been talking about and that are taking place in the US and elsewhere. So one is stuff like decriminalization, which we've kind of talked about, decriminalization of sex work, decriminalization of um, um, drug use uh, and drug abuse. You know, these are not, criminal justice matters, these are public health issues. 
one of the things that I was speaking to uh, about with, with comrades actually from, from New York City was kind of divestiture. So articulating the argument of uh, funneling money away from the police into infrastructure, infrastructure projects like social clubs, social and mental health care, education, sports, looking at alternatives like restorative justice, all of these kinds of things. And these are winnable because often when you talk about police abolition, it seems like pie in the sky thinking, but the, these are the kinds of things that, that are already happening. And importantly, they require all of us to win that on the discursive level so that we can kind of affect this more kind of materialist change. So the world that I think that we need to be imagining is one in which we render the need of the police obsolete. And we can do that with these practical interim measures like divestiture, like decriminalization, and articulating these public health models. Um, I'm going to pick up and agree with uh, some of the points you've made in terms of policing, but then also just talk a bit more broadly around kind of inquest campaign goals and, and the world we want to see. Um, I mean, you know, what we know is that we've criminalised need and criminalised social need. And we have seen this huge expansion in terms of our expectations around what the police should be doing. So uh, Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary, they published a report a couple of years ago. And I think they said most calls to the police, I think it was something like 84 percent, um, were for non-crime incidents. So we're picking up the phone and we're calling the police out for uh, concerns for welfare, for mental health crises. Now, one response is that what we do is we train the police so that they do that better and they respond in a more safe way and um, their use of restraint is better and, and, um, and whatnot. But maybe what we should be doing is calling for a strategic withdrawal of the police from certain functions. And the product of that is what then we do is we invest in youth workers and mental health workers and we have different first responders rather than it being the police. Um, in terms of sort of inquests work, you know, our strap line, it says it on my T-shirt, it's truth, justice and accountability. And there are specific campaigns around that, around access to justice for families so that they have legal representation, that they, that, that they face the kind of post-death investigations on a more equal footing, although they can never be equal in terms of state agencies that have a lot of the knowledge and resources and power to cover up and, 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 and to... Um, uh, hide the circumstances surrounding deaths and families want the answers they want answers around how their loved one died and they also want to prevent future deaths and um, we have seen improvements to the existing system and we keep working for that so Shaney's law uh, came in at the end of last year um, Shaney Lewis died in Bethlehem hospital following restraint I, I think it was by up to nine police officers at one point he was a young black man he'd been taken to uh, the hospital because he was in mental health crisis his parents left him there thinking that he would be safe and when they left he became distressed and they called the police and the police arrived and he died um, now that law that's been brought into force now covers the use of restraints in mental health settings it covers the way that the police intervene and in terms of cameras and those changes will hopefully make things safer um, and they only came about because the people at the centre of that campaign were the families involved. So there's also kind of who do we involve in our campaigns. And whilst we're sort of NGOs and campaign groups, it's really important that they're driven by and we centre the people directly affected. Now, we, you know, we, we use traditional mechanisms. We want to make sure the police are more accountable. But ultimately, we know from our experiences that those legal mechanisms very rarely hold the police to account and they very rarely bring about that systemic change. So it's also trying to think about other alternative ways of thinking about justice and accountability beyond those individualized models of punishment. And um, there's the case of John Burge in Chicago and I'll just speak very briefly about this. So he was a police officer who oversaw the torture um, and abuse of many black men in Chicago who were then subsequently confessed to very serious offences and were imprisoned. Now, there was a long struggle for justice and there were lots of debates about kind of what, whether they won, whether they didn't win, but what looks like a much more transformative model of justice in terms of they couldn't end up holding the individuals to account who were involved in that direct abuse, but they did bring about um, a more transformational change in terms of, or things that may lead to more transformational change, such as all high school students now need to learn about the torture that was meted out um, to, uh, to, to 
people in police detention, and in particular sort of black communities in Chicago. Um, anybody who was directly affected then has access to um, college, free college education. And so these are other things that try to seek not only just to sort of fix it or try to say sorry, which is really important, but also try to say how do we protect future generations from this happening again. And that's around education. It's about teaching people and learning from our mistakes so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. <laughs> Um, so the question was, what does winning look like and how do we get there? Yeah, yeah okay, huge question. <laughs> um, so I think one thing that it's really important to do is just figure out what's going on. Um, I would say one thing I really recommend that you read is Automating Inequality by Virginia Eubanks, if you haven't already read it. Um, and also Philip Alston's report. So he's the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, and he just did, obviously, a huge report on poverty in the UK. But he looks specifically, again, about automation and data in that context. And I think if we want to understand what's happening to people living in poverty, to people subject to policing, um, I think, I think those are important places to start. I actually don't have to say huge about the hostile environment because we have written a guide to the hostile environment. Um, and it essentially sets out what it is, but also includes loads of different actions that individuals can take um, to help dismantle it. On the hostile environment, I would say it's important to be really clear that we have had some really important victories. And those victories have come through strategic litigation. So. Northeast London Migrant Action took a legal claim against a policy that said that if you were an EU national sleeping rough, that meant you were automatically breaching your treaty rights and you could be deported. They took that to court and they won. Um, Migrants' Rights Network uh, took a case represented by Liberty to say that actually um, NHS Digital shouldn't be sharing the data of migrant patients with the Home Office for immigration enforcement purposes, and that has stopped. Um, the Against Borders for Children campaign ended up orchestrating a boycott that 200,000 children and parents took part in and took litigation to say children's nationality and country of birth data shouldn't be collected by the Department for Education for the Home Office, and they won. So I think it's really important to be clear that we have been winning and we can keep winning. Um, and some of the ways in which we can do that, I mean, to be kind of prosaic about it, I would say, first of all, we have to support grassroots organizations um, and organizations and campaigns that are led by people most affected by these issues. So lots of them are actually part of the program at The World Transformed, which is amazing. Um, I know Docs Not Cops are around, but they always need people to help them out. I think Brighton Migrant Solidarity is still going. I think there's City of Sanctuary. There are anti-raids groups. Um, and these are groups that need people to do things like, I mean, I went in the Against Borders for Children email inbox the other day, and there were like a thousand unread emails. People, we, you know, campaign groups need people to help read emails, go back to questions, help out with the website, help out with meals at campaign meetings. You don't have to be an all-star campaigner to be a supportive part of these struggles. Um, you could visit people in immigration detention, so ask detainee support help people to do that. There are immigration detention centers up and down the country, and that means that there are people who can go and visit up and down the country too. Um, you can accompany people who are worried about going to their local authority to ask for state support if they're undocumented. I know that Nelma have piloted an accompanying scheme, and you could talk to them to ask about how you could set that up in your local area. And the same with anti-raids groups. I know Harry and Gay anti-raids in particular um, help other cities set up anti-raids groups so that if an immigration raid is happening, people know how to intervene. So there are really, really practical things that all of us can do. I think the other thing, well, there's a couple of other things that we can do, one of which is holding political parties to account. So obviously, Liberty is a cross-party organization. Whoever is in government um, will be giving them a hard time um, when they're in opposition also, unfortunately for them. But um, I think when we think about what winning looks like, for us, that would be, you know, it would be a meaningful end to the hostile environment. So for us, that would mean everyone being able to access essential goods and services, regardless of their immigration status. Now, I know that Labour policy at the minute is to end the hostile environment, but it's also Labour policy to consult on at which point migrants should be able to access essential goods and services, um, which we don't think is really good enough. Um, we'd also like a conversation around removing 
some of those criminal offences that undocumented migrants are subject to, it doesn't make sense that there is an offence of illegal working or an offence of driving while unlawfully in the UK. Political parties aren't saying anything about that and we really need people to pressure them to start that conversation. Um, on policing, again, I would say from Liberty's point of view, we don't think that there should be suspicionless stop and search powers on the statute books at all. Um, so section 60, that's the power that the government has decided to make it easier for police forces to use. That's the power under which race, disproportion race disproportionality is absolutely at its worst. Um, and I think Labour's position at the minute has been to say, well, actually, these changes aren't as far reaching as you think they are, government, rather than to say this power shouldn't be on the statute book at all. None of us should have our right to privacy intruded on by the state in that way. Um, and similarly, knife crime prevention orders. I know I didn't talk about these, but these are basically knife crime as those. The police can ask a court to impose them on a child as young as 12 if they believe that young person has probably carried a, life, a knife in the last two years. And that order will mean that conditions are placed on where that person can go, who they can see. It, they might have to go to certain places. They might have to do certain things. It might interfere with their work or education. And if they don't comply with the conditions, they're criminalized. If they don't give the police their most up-to-date contact details, they breach the order and they're criminalized. Why is that on the statute books? Well, I'll tell you, it was actually a Labour Lord who brought forward an amendment first, um, and then the government brought forward its own in response. So I think it's really important that this political work happens inside and outside political parties and really holds them to account. Thanks, Liz. Can I just build on some of that as well? Um, for me, much of my research has been involved with young people who have been identified as being gang involved. And these individuals have been subjected to gangs databases, to gangs matrix in London, for example. And in effect, what, I, what we found in that piece of work that these young individuals, predominantly, what's it, 78% are black individuals, 87% are black Asian minority ethnic. These individuals are subjected to over-policing. Some individuals speak about being stopped and searched 200, 300 times. Young people talk about being stopped and searched because it's as normal as putting your clothes on. These are the environments and the hostile environments with which increasingly young black and brown individuals are policed within communities across England and Wales. For me, therefore, advocating for the abolition of gangs databases, I think is extremely important. I think the idea that particular groups and individuals are policed under this discourse of being gang involved determined by the police. Certain self-disclosure, these are individuals who the police believe to be gang involved, is hugely problematic. So I would start from that position as well. Um, and I just wanted to add to the points that um, Grace was making. However, for me, there's a central question. What we have to acknowledge and what I acknowledge is that the criminal justice system is ineffective. It doesn't work. It never has worked. And we have to start from that position and acknowledge how ineffective this system is. If we look at detection rates, detection rates are now under 10% of offences being perpetrated across England and Wales. And that's based on the police definitions of crime as well, less than 10%. What we know is that the vast majority of individuals who are pulled into prison will be reconvicted on release from custody. This is an ineffective system. So from the outset, I begin to build on the premise that we should be looking to shift, abolish, or certainly wind down these institutions, which contribute significant harm to the lives of particular groups and individuals across England and Wales. I also believe the system, therefore, is driven on a principle of risk. We need to identify who is risky so that we can feel safer. Now, what tends to happen is that those individuals who are seen as risky tend to be those individuals who do not look like you in the main. They tend to look like black and brown bodies. Those discourses around who is risky and who poses a problem intensifies, it changes, it transmogrifies, but essentially there are particular groups who will always be deemed as risky. What I would argue is that a system and the criminal justice system needs to be shifted. We need to move towards a notion of a social justice system, a system that responds to the needs of all individuals within society rather than the risk that those individuals are thought to present. I still think it's remarkable that if an individual needs treatment for substance misuse,
they have more chance of getting that within the criminal justice system. If individuals have mental health concerns, you have more chance of getting that res resolved through a criminal justice system. What we need to therefore do is shift towards a clear system that responds to those social needs, particularly experienced in marginalised communities. I guess, finally for me, what does success look like? Well, this annual or biannual figure of this group being this times more likely to be stopped and searched, that group being will begin to disappear. We will move towards a parity. There will be no more time, no, this nine times more or 20 times more. We need to shift away from those discourses. I'm a utopian. I believe in the notion that we should be abolishing the police. The police are trauma-inducing for a group of young people and the vast majority of young people across England and Wales. And as such, we need to shift away from those discourses, from those risk-based discourses towards social justice systems. Yeah? Yeah, I feel like uh, I've got a hard, hard follow now because all the amazing points have been made. Um, I guess in the short term, obviously, I would like to see the decriminalisation of sex work. I would like to know that sex workers are not going to be experiencing raids, detentions, deportations, that they're not more at risk of, of violence because that's what's happening right now. In September, there has been Operation Aidant, which is a European-wide uh, set of raids, um, predominantly for migrant workers working in uh, brothels um, in London and Soho. There will probably have been raids, um, and there will be migrant sex workers who will have had their earnings taken away from them. They will have probably been um, harassed and violated by police, and then will probably be being deported. And that is seen as a measure of help and care, when in reality, there is nothing like that. It's just punishment. It's, it's punishment. It's, uh, and also, to be quite frank, it's about the criminalization of migration. Like, we can't, like, the, the discourse around trafficking that has sort of built and built and built over the last 10, 15 years in this country and in across the globe, really, it's, it's so around our ability to uh, criminalize and um, assert borders. It's not about saving women. It's about determining the bad guys that we can send home. Um, and we really need to disrupt the idea that it's, it's, it's the state who are going to save, save us from the world's problems. They are actually creating them. Um, I think that for me, a, a sort of, I don't know, North Star is trying to make prisons unintelligible, trying to make the police as a presence in our society unintelligible because right now, prison abolition and police abolition to the majority of people feels unintelligible and we need that to be completely turned on its head because for the majority of people who are experiencing that violence, the idea that the police can produce safety and justice is unintelligible and we need to be finding ways to be able to communicate that with the with the mainstream public and actually make sure that that is done in such a way that people realize and really take to heart that because right now for me I feel like we've we've only just started being able to make that conversation meaningfully happen within the left and we still have so much further to go like the fact that I'm even on this panel you know is down to people like yourself and people who have run this program this year actually feeling like sex workers have a have a have something to contribute and have something to say. And that has completely changed the landscape over the last God knows how long. So we're only at the beginning, but we have so much more to do. And I feel like if we can learn from each other's struggles and build towards this sort of North Star, then we actually have a really good shot of being able to change things fundamentally um, and improve people's material conditions in their lives. But it means trying to be really radical in what we're calling for and you know, unfortunately, she didn't win. But the fact that she got where she got is a real testament to the fact that these messages are resonating with people and that we've come so much further along. The idea of putting, you know, decriminalizing prostitution on a ticket. God, yeah, it's it's crazy. So the fact that it's becoming not crazy is like really cheering for me. And the fact that we're having this conversation and we're actually in a position where the room is filled is really amazing to me. And I think that, you know, the rest of the sessions are going to be incredible drawing on all these pieces and sort of building that sort of 
that web of uh, solidarity. So yeah, thanks for putting it on. Thank you. Thank you.